Welcome to the Youth Sport Podcast. My name is Rihanna Poskin, and I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly within youth sport. It feels great when a kid comes up to you and says, Coach, because of you, my life changed in the best way. It would feel awful to hear that because of you, the coach, a kid doesn't want to have anything to do with it ever again. I believe that kids deserve to have fun, to learn, to grow, to compete, and to play in a great environment. Join me as I interview guests that spill the tea on youth sport in order to help you make an enormous impact with kids right now. This episode of the Youth Sport Podcast is brought to you by Lululemon. I am part of the Lululemon Collective and will receive commissions when you shop through my link. Buying something for you or your loved ones like my favorite warm down joggers, helps me to continue to bring interesting and empowering conversations for everyone. I have to tell you, when I'm coaching, I want to make sure that I'm dressed appropriately, I'm comfortable, my clothes stand up to all kinds of random situations, and that I have pockets. You never know who's going to ask you to hold something for them or what random things you need to carry with you. The Lululemon warm down joggers take care of all of my needs. I invite you to find your go-to item by browsing through the entire Lululemon site. You won't be disappointed. Please use the link provided in the video description below to start shopping. Welcome to another episode of the Youth Sport Podcast. Today, I have an amazing person joining me that makes an awesome impact on everyone he meets. Ryan Ballin joins us today. Welcome, Ryan. Thank you, Rihanna. Thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. I'm happy that you're here too. Um, Before we get chatting, let me tell you all about Ryan. Ryan has played sports his whole life, starting with baseball and hockey at age eight and nine. He continued to play all sports until high school where he started focusing on baseball primarily. He landed a baseball scholarship at California University of Pennsylvania, where he received a lot of recognition as an all-conference player, MVP, and second team NCAA All-American player. He continued to play professionally after his amateur career with a minor league contract with the Boston Red Sox and international play in Germany, Australia, Holland, and Quebec. Ryan not only plays baseball, he coaches as well. He is currently the head coach of the U15 Ontario Royals. He has coached kids as young as three years of age all the way up to adults, including athletes looking to go pro. Although Ryan has many accolades to his name, I believe that his character needs to be highlighted as well. Ryan and I grew up together and we have mutual friends. Every person that talks about Ryan has the utmost respect for him. He is a kind person, he gives back to his community and he impacts those around him to make their lives better. Those are the qualities that I think are important and Ryan uses baseball as his vessel to put those qualities to use. And I would like to start off with a little story. You may not remember this, but this was pretty funny. We were at a house party at my house and the house party got taken outside and everybody was having a snowball fight. And all of a sudden I got whizzed by the fastest snowball (laughs) that I had ever had come by my head. And at that point I realized that there was something that was like beyond everybody else. You, you were beyond everybody else. (laughs) And I can make the analogy close to like when an MMA fighter should not use their hands fighting like some guy at the bar because he could kill them. So I think that you should not be allowed to be in snowball fights because (laughs) I think it's a very unfair advantage. (laughs) I think that's, yes, I think that's a fair assessment. (laughs) Okay, so like I said, Ryan and I grew up together and he's from a family of four kids. I'm from a family of five. And I know what it's like being in amongst a whole bunch of kids, but then also being uh, really athletic and into sport. So I would love to hear your side, Ryan. Maybe we've never talked about this before, but what was it like in your household having an older brother, crazy athletic, having twin younger siblings underneath and everybody wanting to play something and your parents having to juggle all of that? It's, well, it's kind of, yeah, kind of like you said, um, it was juggling. I think my mom and my dad kind of had to figure out a balance between running a house making sure they had enough money coming in so that everything that was going out could continue going out. Uh, I remember at one point hearing my parents refer to picking us up as a quote unquote pickup. 
And I found that to sound kind of frustrating to me. But then, you know, as I got older, I kind of started to put it all together. And I realized that all my parents did for probably the majority of, I don't know, 10 or 12 or 15 years, all they did is drive us to sports. I mean, my older brother was a rugby player. He played school, soccer, volleyball, basketball. He was into baseball when he's younger, but rugby is the thing he stuck with. And he played that all the way through university. Uh, my younger sister was very much into basketball. She played softball. She played volleyball. She was kind of more keen on basketball and we were excited about her taking that to the collegiate level, but she really wasn't that into it. She kind of just did it for fun, but she was pretty great at it. Um, but she had to go all over the place everywhere and everything. My younger brother, similar to me, was very much into baseball, but also played volleyball, basketball. Adam played hockey when he was young too. And then there was me playing anything and everything as much as I could. So for our parents, it was just shipping us around all the dang time to where we needed to be. And there was no complaints out of them. And, and for the four of us, we all kind of had an understanding that everybody was kind of in season at all times. And sometimes <laughs> that meant that the, the in season person that had a game got first dibs on dinner. And <laughs> if, if said in person or in season person was going to be getting home a little bit late, we would try to make sure we left a little bit extra food for them. So there was always a bit of understanding between us, but we were, we were fiercely competitive in the sports that we're in, but when it came to kind of each other, I think we we're a pretty supportive family because we all knew that we were pretty serious about the whole thing. And luckily enough for us, our parents decided to take it just as serious as well. So that was very fortuitous, I guess I could say for me and my upbringing, very supportive family. Yeah, that's awesome. And I think as we become adults, you realize, I mean, as at the time, you just kind of go with the flow, you get rides here and there from other people. But when you become the adult, and you see all of the lack of personal time that you have, because you're carting everybody else around, and then coaching too, was your dad coaching as well? My dad uh, predominantly ended up coaching me in my baseball as we were growing up. And that was, I don't know if that was necessarily by choice. I think that was kind of more born out of necessity in that Neil played ball kind of seriously until about grade eight, grade nine. And then he turned to rugby. And I remember my dad coaching a team or two of his over the, those younger years. And I also remember my dad coaching a team or two of Adam's. Uh, just for kind of context, my older brother was three years older than me. And then my younger brother and sister who are tip twins were three years younger than me. Um, and my younger brother had a couple of good coaches around his age. So at my age, uh, my dad got a little bit more into coaching. There was a couple guys that he coached with in Whitby as we were kind of growing up, but then my dad kind of became the, the main guy to coach at our level, which worked out well because Adam at the younger age had some pretty decent coaches so yeah my dad was pretty my dad was pretty involved in my baseball playing days right up until high school when I kind of ended up not being here geographically at which point he had to kind of let me go yeah was that hard for him do you think <laughs> or was that hard uh, for you I, well it was it was I think it was kind of interesting the way it kind of worked out because at that point when I was 17 18 you know 19 going into university I had kind of come to a realization that a lot of the technical things that were going to help me mature as a ball player, my dad really couldn't provide it anymore. But right. luckily for me, a lot of the foundational and fundamental things he was able to provide. So that was really ingrained into me until I kind of got to those later years in high school where I started realizing if I'm going to go out into the, the big ocean of ball players, I'm going to have to find some, some bigger fish to teach me a bit. So it all kind of worked out well timing wise. Awesome. And you mentioned your older brother is three years older. Were there ever fights in the house? Uh, yeah, there was, there was a couple battles. There's a few <laughs> battles. Um, a lot of it had to do, I think a lot, in the end, a lot of it had to do with just priority. Um, we were pretty considerate about each other a lot of times, but sometimes it came down to it's, I want the remote. I want to watch what <laughs> I want to watch. Or the reason everybody's got to be quiet because I'm trying to do this. <laughs> the reason I ask that is because uh, as I have conversations with different people, the sibling conversation often comes up and the, the ones that are younger have often taken the brunt of it. But in the end, they kind of spin the story that it actually helped them out in the end. I don't think you realize that at the time when you're getting pounded, but maybe later on being able to yeah. hold your own. <laughs> Well, Lori was the golden daughter, not uh, only one yeah. of the youngest ones, but she was the daughter. Adam did catch a lot 
Adam did catch a lot from Neil and I, uh, <laughs> so he had to toughen up pretty quick. So yeah. I would say that about I would say that about Adam. He he had to learn how to be a little bit tougher and a little bit harder at a little bit younger age than me, the middle kid. I was kind of the the guy sandwiched in the middle, and I maybe snuck by, flew under the radar sometimes, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, let's move on to as you enter into university. So uh, we both went to the same university, California University mm, of Pennsylvania. Yeah. And that confuses everybody when I say Cal U and then I throw in of PA. But uh, yes. <laughs> when I went down from my recruiting trip, uh, it was funny because when the girls were taking me around campus, we were, they were just showing me around. And then uh, if they found out that I knew one of the guys on the soccer team. So we both went to high school with one of the guys that's played, that played there. And then we're, we said, well, let's go say hi to him. He doesn't know that you're here. So we went over to his dorm and we were just hanging out. We had to like call him down to the lobby. And all of a sudden you walk in and I was like, hey, how are you? And then you're like, whoa, <laughs> what are you doing here? And then the girls that I was with, they were like, how, how do you know people? You know, like <laughs> you, you don't even go to school here and you're from Canada and you know two people on campus. So I was kind of cool for half a second there. <laughs> there you go. Way to go, Rihanna. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So you play in, uh, at, in Pennsylvania. So you're away from home and you're on yeah. a scholarship and all of a sudden people realize that you're a really really good ball player and you lived in the one of the dirtiest houses that i know of in oh come on rihanna <laughs> come on it, well, hey I'll, I'll give you that it was dirty i don't know if it was one of the dirtiest but it wasn't the cleanest yeah do you have good memories from living with those guys yes I do. Uh, just for more context, there was nine of us in there. <laughs> oh my so God, I didn't bit... know that. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There's nine of us in there. It was a, a big old huge house that just had a whack of rooms and they're all just chopped into single bedrooms, double bedrooms. Yeah. We just lived all over the place and slept all over the place. Um, yeah, it was all the baseball guys. I think for one of the years that we, had, we were there, another buddy of ours just happened to live there with us, but it was always known as the baseball house similar to all the different houses on campus in town. Um, yeah. yeah, we were we were known as one of the houses that really didn't care all that much about our house. <laughs> <laughs> so there was a lot of fun to be had, but I, I have a lot of fond memories. I mean, it's it was such a kind of, I guess, immersive experience to say being in college, especially when you're living in a dorm on the same wing with a lot of your teammates, or you decide in your sophomore or junior year to move off campus and go live with your teammates and everybody's waking up at the same time to go to practice and everyone's getting to bed because we got a game or two tomorrow and everyone just kind of ends up on a very similar schedule and it just lends to the entire atmosphere of how we need to work together to do this and I think it's I think it's interesting as a ball player maybe maybe not similar Rihanna in comparison to your uh, experience as a soccer player back in the late 90s early 2000s in that you probably weren't thinking about trying to go pro I yeah. think for a lot of for a lot of baseball players in college, the thought is I'm going to work through this for three or four years and then I'm going to go pro. Maybe the same as basketball, maybe the same as football, but probably not so much for female sports. Um, so, you know, all, all the things that we were doing was not only getting an education and and uh, thinking about baseball for the now, we we're also thinking about the future and I want to get drafted and I want to move on and I want to see if I can take this to that next level. So living in the baseball house, as trashy as it was, was the exact <laughs> environment that I needed to be in. Yeah, um, I was looking at the dates and then I wanted to line it up with what was going on in Major League Baseball around the time that you guys were looking to go pro. And there were a lot of drugs at that time period. Uh, yeah. Holy jeez. What was that like for you guys that were playing university ball and then knowing that there was pressure on you to really, really push it to the limit just to be able to get a chance to go pro? Well, yeah, it's it's a, it's a thing, size. I mean, it always kind of has been a thing in a lot of sports, but I think baseball was always that every man, quote unquote, uh, we call it every person sport where you don't have to be the biggest lug of a dude I mean you don't have to be a 300 pound linebacker to play second base and you don't have to be seven foot tall like a center in basketball I mean you can be a uh, an outfielder in baseball and be five foot ten and weigh 170 pounds and be a pretty normal sized guy but when I was playing uh, uh, through high school and college the game was changing a bit and that they were looking for more power they wanted guys blasting balls over the fence they wanted guys throwing 90 95 miles an hour and that's definitely not something that has changed I think what's changed 
in the future of sports is that it's gone a lot more science-based, a lot more training-based. There's a lot more pressure on players to perform at that level, um, which I think in a lot of ways has resulted in guys getting hurt a lot more frequently and kind of ending careers early. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a whole other kind of conversation, I would say. But if, if no, I had to kind of... that out too because of overuse injuries. So carry on and then let's go back to that. Uh, so it's, when I was playing, I mean, I, I got signed by the Boston Red Sox as a left-handed specialist pitcher, and that's still definitely a thing that exists. Um, what that kind of means is me as a left-handed throwing pitcher and batters as left-handed swinging batters, that's a matchup where the left-handed pitcher has a serious advantage. So I was signed predominantly as a guy that could come in in those situations and get out their big left-handed hitters. Very, very kind of niche, I would say. Um, I threw the ball about 86 to 88 miles an hour, and I threw a lot of good off-speed stuff, which means I could change the speed of the pitch. I could sink it. I could cut it. I could make it sink, curve, rise, do all these different things, and I could throw it kind of wherever I wanted all of the strike zone. And that was something that, you know, through the years in baseball has been very sought after. But around the time when I was getting to my senior year in college, Mark McGuire hitting a million home runs, Sammy Sosa hitting a million home runs, controversy around the supplements these guys are using. I mean, I took a lot of supplements in college and I got my fastball in pro ball up to 88 miles an hour. And one of the last meetings I had with the minor league coordinator with the Red Sox right before I got released, this is probably about a week before I got released in 2003, is he told me, your fastball is sitting around 88, Ryan. We need you to throw harder. And, I mean, I, I could have taken that any number of ways. I could have taken it as I need to train harder. I could have taken it as I need to change my mechanics and my technique to figure out how to throw harder. Or I could have done a thing that immediately would have helped me throw harder and I chose to not do that and in college I played with a couple guys that chose to do that and it definitely showed that it increased their ability to play and I played in pro ball with guys that definitely chose to do that and you could see that it definitely enhanced their performance yeah. but uh for me it was kind of a moral issue I mean I knew that it would definitely help and it might be get might get me over the hump that they were looking for me to get over but I never really wanted to do it that way and you know, I kind of look back and I think, you know what, I I wonder what would have happened if I did, uh, but never do I really think, you know, I wish I had it done. I'm glad I chose not to, and I'm glad I pushed my natural body as hard as I possibly could, and I'm glad I got as close as I got. It would have been nice to have made it, but I went as far as I could, and I laid all the chips on the table. And you're, Uh, right? The way you want it, the way you wanted to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, the way I want, the whole thing kind of ended up you know, the way I wanted it minus making it, but I, you know, I can't, I can't look at that and be upset with that because I did everything I could to make it. Yeah. Awesome. And then, uh, so now we've got a lot of rules and regulations with young players in terms of how many throws they can throw essentially. Yeah. Pitch, pitch count has become a big thing. Yeah. So what did that exist when you were playing? Not really. Like I remember growing up, Uh, When I was very young, there was an innings number. You were only allowed to throw X amount of innings in a game. Uh, Sometimes in tournaments, you were only allowed to throw X number of innings through an entire Friday, Saturday, Sunday tournament. But I remember remember growing up pitching an entire nine-inning game and looking at the pitch count afterwards and saying, whoa, I threw 160 pitches today. But a lot of times, kids of that same age nowadays are limited to maybe 80. Yeah. so, you know, there, there's a lot of benefits around having these pitch counts because I do think it does a lot to ensure that players remain safe and healthy and don't overexert themselves in ways that could create prolonged or, you know, definitive injury in the future. Yeah. Are you um, noticing that any careers are even cut short where these kids are um, not even able to use their arm as well at the age that they might go pro because of overuse earlier? Well, uh, I mean, overuse, it's. It's tough. It's really, really tough to say because at this point, considering the amount of training that goes into even youth baseball, I mean, you know, I I remember watching old videos in the 90s of Devon White taking an interview and taking a camera crew around the Sky Dome, as it was known as back then. Holy geez. (laughs) Um, But 
but he was showing them the Blue Jays weight room and there was a couple like elastic therabands and he was showing them how the, he does curls standing on the band and curling and he was showing them how he does like trunk twists. And right. It's like, holy geez, man, guys weren't, guys, <laughs> you know, guys were having a couple beers and a couple cigarettes after the game back then. Yeah. And nowadays, you know, guys are on diets down to the calorie. Um, yeah. So, you know, there, there, there's a lot to be said that these pitch count restrictions and limitations could be doing something to help players remain healthy a little bit longer. But then there's a lot of unknowns around the amount that we have young kids training and, mm-hmm. and trying to get their bodies in peak physical condition. I mean, there's a lot of limiting factors. Training can be one, diet can be one, access to coaching and different resources can be another. But, you know, genetics might come into play in a lot of ways and some kids bodies are able to do it and maybe some kids bodies just aren't able to do it and and I think it's important for us to pay attention to all these potential factors that could play into the health and wellness of our young players but at the same time I think the verdict is still very much out in that we're not going to be able to compile enough information for quite a few more years in terms of pitch counts and how much does it help and how much is this training for these young kids really beneficial compared to is it just beating their bodies down too much at an early age yeah are you an advocate of multi-sport athletes at a young age a hundred million bajillion percent i think i I, I knew i knew you were going to say that i just have to (laughs) yeah (laughs) but but, hey that's But that's a that's actually a tricky question rihanna in that i now coach the 15 year old Ontario Royals elite baseball team and it's a year-long program and it's a big resources time energy money for all the families involved we yeah. we take a sh- we take a short break actually right now we're on break for about two weeks and then our season wraps up in July so August is time off just to have a summer yeah um, but it kind of goes against a lot of the principles over the years which is baseball players shouldn't throw all year they should just totally shut down for three or four months we kind of do that but we do throw a little bit through October, November, and December, and we never actually take an entire break. Uh, so, you know, I wouldn't recommend at all younger kids specializing in any sport. I'm coaching a group of kids that at 15, they've decided that this is the sport they want to play. And there's a couple of kids on my team that still do play hockey and still do play this and still play that. But, you know, 15 you is the introductory year to players kind of deciding whether they want to really have a go at this one sport. So I think around right. the age of 15 years old, getting into a specialization is okay. Yeah. Um, if I had the opportunity when I was young to join one of these teams at 15, I absolutely would have. Yeah. But I would have hoped that if I wanted to do it at 12, my parents would have said not a chance because yep. I think about the benefits that basketball and volleyball and, you know, still running track and, just being able to play every sport, the way it kind of promotes agility and body awareness. I, I think specializing too early can potentially be seriously detrimental. Yeah. Um, but then I get a devil's advocate myself and say that it could be the exact right thing for certain kids, because if a kid wants to just eat, sleep, breathe baseball at 10, and they have no sort of inkling of doing anything else, then maybe it's time to specialize. But I think as a general rule, the more variety of sports and the more variety of experiences, the better. Yeah. Well, what I'm thinking is, um, and I've said this a couple of times, just in conversation with different people, I'm trying to come up with ways of how can we still accommodate that kid that needs to do multi-sport movements in order to keep their body just developing in the right kind of a way. And even though they are just signing up for baseball and playing year round, I feel like if we tap into the right coaches, who are still going to do those multi-sport movements, even though you're working with a baseball team, we could have a a ton of benefits, even um, though they are primarily coming just for baseball. So it really is dependent on who is coaching, what their, you know, mentality is around the development of that child. And I mean, like I just said, they are still a child. So we still have to think Mm -hmm. about, you know, like what are all those things that are doing? And even if you were to play something for 10 minutes within a baseball session, that's not technically baseball, I think you can still tap into kids in a fun way. And I believe that the point of sport is to get them to want to come back. And if you've got a coach who's just throwing out some fun things and changing it up every once in a while, you'll have kids that are coming to you that are saying like, coach, what are we doing today? You know, like really pumped up about it. 
not only do you get the engagement, but then also I think that they might be a little more focused for that training session when you do jump back into the baseball stuff. So that's just mm -hmm. me trying to think about what we can do, even though the organizations primarily are going year round now. Uh, I think that's the type of idea that could be very helpful for um, any sort of program, like the one I kind of coach with, where they're getting into kind of specialization at an early age. I think there are, I think there's a huge potential for all different types of uh, roadblocks, if I would say, in that type of thought process. I mean, it's as kind of insane as it is to think this way. A lot of parents, you know, their kid's future and their opportunity to raise their kid. And, you know, if if I'm spending top dollar to bring little Johnny to this baseball facility, I don't want a minute spent on anything other than his baseball development. And I think, you know, that there's a lot of things that kind of come into play there. I think, you know, a coach being able to to make a point and prove and show that they have the understanding of how this works and be able to demonstrate that something that could be beneficial to the progression of baseball. I mean, yeah, maybe soccer is good if it crosses over into baseball. So maybe those are, those are some good ideas, but I think, yeah, it's, especially in a hockey culture, you know, we live in a hockey culture in the GTA and it's all about hockey, hockey. I yeah. can only imagine somebody going out there. Okay. Everybody drop your sticks. We're going to learn how to do a, a little bit of figure skating for the next <laughs> You're going to have a, you're going to have an uproar in the stands. You're going to oh, yeah. have a mutiny. Yeah. And because ice time is so expensive, you really only have sometimes yeah. 50 minutes. So like, you're going to use like what you said, I'm going to use all that top dollar on hockey and just hockey. Yep. So yeah, it's an interesting conversation that I feel like we need to have some more of. I wanted to talk a little bit about you playing overseas. Did you see mm. a difference in terms of international baseball as opposed to North American baseball? You know, it's it's the same, the game of baseball. I think it's, for the most part, that's one of the real cool things about baseball and the way baseball is designed. The, the layout of the field kind of determines that it's played the exact same everywhere. I think, you know, the the level of baseball that I played at in Germany and Australia, which was considered kind of semi-pro in that not everybody was paid. Some people were paid a little bit. You know, some of the foreign guys like me were paid a little bit more. Um, but the pace of that game was, was very good. You know, I wouldn't say it was quite pro level compared to North American, but it was like a good division one kind of feel. Like it was very, very high level um in terms of their ability to understand the game they got a lot of great coaching and a lot of great coaches that go over there from north america so it was pretty much the same my experience playing overseas um i mean it was one, one of the parts about playing overseas that i found to kind of be the most exciting and the most interesting was just getting an opportunity to live in different places and kind of feel like i was being immersed in a different country country for, for the two summers that i was there i kind of felt like i was a german and for the six months that I was in Australia, I was Australian. And, you know, yeah. the little bit of time in Indiana that I spent, a little time in Quebec that I spent. So everywhere I went, I kind of, kind of felt like I, I became a little bit of that. And I think one of the parts that I really took away from that, um, you know, as an opportunity to travel, and I think a lot of people who spend some time traveling in their life for a prolonged period, you kind of learn that all over the world, it's so amazing that we're all doing so many different things. But when you kind of strip it all back, everyone's doing the exact same thing. We're we're trying to live, we're trying to love, we're trying to eat, we're trying to breathe, we're trying to care for, we're trying to be cared for. We want to know that things are going to be good tomorrow. We don't want to know that things are good today. And, you know, we want a little bit of entertainment sometimes. So baseball, sports, soccer, whatever, it pops up all over the world when you get people in a position where they're trying to relax a little bit on their downtime. So my, my international baseball experience was it was a great experience for me to go play ball overseas as a professional and kind of an ambassador of baseball. Yep. And it, it really kind of helped me in my life moving forward in that it just made me realize that the world over, we're all kind of together. We're all kind of just doing the same thing. We're all just trying to live different yeah. ways, but we're all trying to do the same thing. How was it joining new teams everywhere you went? Because if you've changed almost like every every year, you'd have a new group that yeah. you were playing with. How was that? It, it's all it's always good to join a new team when you're the guy. When <laughs> when you're coming into a new team and everybody already knows that you're supposed to be one of the guys on the team, one of the dudes. So it always feels like hey, that's the new Canadian guy. He's supposed to be legit. Oh, he's our new pitcher. He's this, he's that. So, you know, it was always interesting and exciting the the last kind of four or five years that I played because everywhere I went you know everybody already had some kind of prior knowledge and you know at that level uh you're just looking for people that are going to help the team win and 
you know, you learn in time that the, the clubhouse personality and all that kind of stuff really, really helps out the team environment. But, you know, right at the beginning, um, it was a usually a really good experience for me coming into a new team because I'm walking in there and the assumption already is that I'm, I'm there to help the team. Yeah. I'm already a pretty talented guy and I got to be able to help this team win. So for me, a lot of times, you know, it, you might see that as a stressful environment. For, but for me, I think that's one of the reasons why I was very successful as an athlete, because it, nothing really tended to bother me that much. I was usually pretty chill about everything. And yeah. if I'm coming in and you guys are expecting to be good, then I'll just be good. Kind <laughs> yeah. of simple. You know, yeah. you didn't want to create any you. drama. No drama. Just I'll no be drama. good. If you guys want me to be good, so I'll just be good. <laughs> All good. No problem. And now nutritionally, I don't know. Are you still vegan? No, I was. Yeah, yeah. Holy geez. Way and, to go, Rihanna. Okay. The reason I'm yeah. asking that is because I wasn't sure when that started and traveling, obviously, in different countries, that'd be really hard to have a very specific diet that you were trying to, yes. right? So um, while you were um, a vegan, um, well, you, you're always considered an athlete. So how is that nutritionally for any young person or coach that's working with someone that wants to be vegan? What would you help them out with in terms of your experience with that diet? Um, well, it's, it's tough. Let me say that. Yeah. Um, I, so just to, to kind of explain a little bit, I at no point was vegan and was still training to excel at any particular sport. I okay. spent uh, I spent quite a few years kind of focusing on a little bit of strength training, a lot of different kinds of cardio. I did Muay Thai kickboxing for quite a few years. Um, my wife now owns a climbing gym, so I've been doing rock climbing for the past five, six years. Um, but I was vegan for, I think it was about eight years. Yeah, that's a good amount of time. Um, good amount of time. I think if I had any sort of tip for any young athlete that was thinking about trying to go a little bit animal free it's all about amino acids holy geez did i not eat enough protein okay i kind of as the time went on and i was trying to do as much as i could to get as many different sources you know beans nuts anything everywhere grains supplements different types of shakes i did everything i could to try to get as much protein into my body and i never just found that i could get enough the way a lot of this stuff kind of plays out in my mind i think there are so many different factors and variables that play into it so you know some some people, when they talk about nutrition, they're talking about simply amino acids and then protein. And then there's the, help me out, Rihanna. Rihanna, what are the ones, essential amino acids? Yep. What are the yep. ones? Yeah. So some people say you Branch can. chain you amino get, acids. Chain, yeah, a lot of this stuff. I mean, I, I don't know tons about it. I do understand that you can get this from here and you can't get that from there. So I think I just did myself a disservice over my entire kind of veganism career in that I didn't learn enough. I didn't pay attention to it enough. And as time went on, I wasn't feeling as good as I could have, should have. Um, yeah. And I decided to cross over and just start eating a little bit of fish. And okay. immediately I kind of started to feel not as creaky as I was feeling for a while. And then before you know it, a friend of mine mentioned the steak and then it was all over. <laughs> I was back in. <laughs> um, but you know, even, even now my wife and I, and our family, we try to do as much as we can to mix in as many vegetarian options as we can. I don't think we need to eat even close to the amount of animal that we eat in this world. I think it's absolutely unnecessary and basically ridiculous along with a lot of the other things that I think we're doing on this planet at this time. But yeah. I think dialing back on a lot of the animal products would help us in, I, you know, I, in, in such a way that I can't even describe. Yeah. Um, but if anybody's thinking about kind of experimenting with it, I would say don't do it right off the bat. Don't go cold turkey. I mean, start yeah. to think about, you know, maybe one meal a day that you would eat meat, maybe cut it out. Yeah. Uh, and then maybe eventually you can start thinking about Saturday and Sunday, I'm not going to eat meat. And then eventually you can start thinking about Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I'm not going to eat meat. And then maybe you can flip it to the other way and say, Monday to Friday, I'm not going to eat meat. It, it can be a gradual process. And I think you got to think a lot about your health and the way your body has been breaking down food over your entire life. If you shock it a little bit too much, I think it could potentially, you know, have some short term negative effects. But as time goes on, those can kind of become a little bit more prolonged and, you know, maybe not serious, but maybe serious. But anybody thinking about kind of going vegetarian or vegan, I think it's something that you should absolutely consider. 
Uh, I think it can be great for your body. I think there's a lot of science that shows that there's a lot of vegan athletes out there that are just whipping everybody's butts. And I think it has a lot to do um, with, you know, an, a person's kind of personal biology. I think it could be great. Um, and I think the evidence and the science is showing that it could be great, but I don't think it's something that anybody should just jump right into because I think it could be a, a transition period for a lot of people. Yeah, and uh, that's what I really like about um, your character is that you're conscientious of all kinds of different things. So you just even going through that explanation of veganism, you can see that your brain is, you know, processing all kinds of other things that are going on in terms of how we treat the planet, maybe how we treat animals, you know, all those different things. And I really appreciate that you're working with young people because I feel like you maybe I'm just making this up, but I feel like a lot of that might come through in your coaching in terms of not just being like the quote unquote jock, but also making sure that we're well-rounding young people. And yeah. so if you can talk a little bit about your coaching style, I would love to know how you approach working with young people. From a young age, I would say I was pretty conscientious of a lot of things. Like I remember curling up in my bed when I was 15, 16 years old with a copy of the AK Press, which is just an old publication that gave you a listing of books and magazines that were all non-conformity, smash capitalism, let's figure out how to turn this world into a better place. And I was always kind of interested in that stuff, but my interest kind of took me more towards baseball and not smashing capitalism, whether yeah. that's for better or worse, I can't tell you. But I remember kind of from an early age, kind of thinking about, you know, who I am in my place and what I can do to kind of help out because I don't really think this is a world that we're supposed to be just stomping on. I think we're supposed to be kind of taking care of it. And I think we all kind of, we all kind of grew out of the sludge of the sea billions of years ago, maybe, but at this point we're all kind of in this together. And, you know, when I think about my ability to impress upon young people, the values that I think are important, I think that, you know, my, my knowledge and my ability as a baseball coach combined with my understanding of what's going on in the world, I think I can kind of marry those two things together and I can use coaching as a platform for me to help young people grow up into decent young humans. And, you know, as much as parents are paying me to help their kids push on in baseball as far as they possibly can, I think there's a, whether it's said or unsaid, I think there's an understanding that a big part of my job is to just make sure that these kids continue growing up right and I want them all to grow up right and I think that's part of my job and I think that you know there's one or two kids that I'm working with that might go pro there's a whack of them that I think probably will land themselves in scholarship positions and they're going to be in a position where they have to leave the nest for four entire years like you and I did and you can remember Rihanna what it's like you got to go down there and it's a little scary and you got to be ready to go and you got to have confidence and you got to have integrity and you got to know that you're the goods and you got to know that you can kind of handle this world. And I think I would be doing a disservice to kids if I taught them that baseball was all about baseball, because I don't think that's what it's all about. I think it's about baseball, but it's about teammates and it's about yourself and it's about finding a place in a group of people and it's about working together for a common goal. And it's about learning how to win, but it's also learning how to get smoked and get yeah. back up after a big loss and dust yourself off and, yeah. trust the process and have faith in what you're doing and have some respect for the game and have respect for your coaches and respect the umpires and respect the decisions. And I could just go on and on and on. And I think if I coach these kids to just go out there and try to crush the other team, because we're just trying to win, I think I'd be making a big mistake. I'm trying to teach them that it's all about going out there and winning, but at the same time, it's all about kind of having an idea of what it is that you're trying to do and who you want to be. And we got to work together to try to get ourselves there. Yeah. Did you have a problem leaving pro baseball um, in terms of that was a big part of who you were? Did you have any identity that was just simply wrapped around being a player? Yeah, I actually, there's, there's a moment in time that I remember and I'll tell you a little story because it was kind of soul crushing, but at the same time, I think after this moment, I kind of began like a long process of figuring out who in the hell I was again. I was 27. No, wait, hold on. I was 26 and I was playing in Germany and there was an open, no, it was an invite. Sorry, not an open tryout. An open tryout means anybody and their uncle is allowed to just show up and try. But there was an invite only tryout being held by 
a New York Met scout and he was holding it in a city in Germany called Bonn, which I think a lot of people have probably heard of. Uh, great stadium, great facility. They're having a tryout there and I was invited along with a lot of the younger, talented German guys and uh, along with some of the international guys like me. So I show up at this tryout knocking balls out of the park i'm running faster than everybody i'm whipping balls from the outfield to home plate on no hop i'm just impressing the heck out of this guy he says hey ryan on this next hit i want you to hit the ball and i want you to run as fast as you can to first because i need to know how long it takes you to get there so i try to hit a little line drive i hit it 400 feet out of the park i booked it to first he times me he goes get back over here he calls me in he goes, what the hell are you doing here? <laughs> I said, I don't know, man. I said, I got released by the Red Sox a couple of years. I knew I still had some goods in me and I wanted to keep playing and I just can't crack back into North America. So I'm looking for a chance for somebody to sign me. Yeah. And he goes, well, how old are you? And I said, I'm 26. And he sighs, goes, ah, oh. and he shakes my hand and he says, good talking to you. Oh, no. So in that moment, I kind of realized the thing that was creeping into my head the past couple of years. And that thing was, you can get to a certain age where they kind of think you're past your prime. And if we sign this guy to a minor league contract, if it takes him two or three years to get there, we don't get him there in the big leagues until maybe he's 30. And then if he breaks down early, we really only get him for a couple of years. So this guy, as good as he looks, not worth the time or the investment. So that was kind of a moment where I was like, ah, man, I think I'm running out of time. Oh, no. Um, yeah, that's I, hard. I played, oh, it was tough. It was tough to, it was really tough to kind of feel that I didn't get to decide. It was kind of decided for me. Right. Um, but it's okay. You know, it, it's kind of something that I had to think about. And I played a little bit longer and I ended up back in Toronto and I'm riding around in the big smoke and, and I'm living a good kind of life. I'm working I'm doing my thing and for a little while I was kind of just really wondering what what am I supposed to be doing like I spent my whole life as this guy that was trying to make it to the big leagues and now it's officially been decided for me that I can't go there so what am I supposed to do yeah. um so it was an interesting couple years but I, I'm very thankful that I spent those couple years being in Toronto and you know I was working with uh, homeless and street involved youth. I kind of end ended up doing that for about 10 years. So that was a, a good opportunity for me to kind of, you know, keep helping out in a way that I felt like I could help out. And, you know, it, it was, it was a, it was a period for me where I kind of felt a little bit lost, but as time went on and, you know, I kind of settled into not having to go or not feeling like I have to make it to the big leagues and I can just kind of be a guy and, yeah. And figure out what I wanted to do. And, you know, I, I think that was a pretty good experience for me because it allowed me to to relax and get away from baseball. You know, inevitably, I ended up coming back to baseball this time as a coach. But it was a yeah. it was a cool period in my life in that, you know, there was a good four or five years where there wasn't baseball. Yeah. Uh, and I just got to live in the city and I got to experience Toronto and I got to experience everything that it kind of has to offer. And and I guess I got pulled back into baseball, but it is what it is. There's not yeah. much we can really do about that. So how could you help a young person who really does want to make it? Their goal is to play pro and they're going to do everything possible to get there. And maybe that dream is realized. Maybe it's not. How would you prepare for the downfall that comes thereafter? Do you have any tips for young people um, just to have it in their mind almost as they enter into that stage of their life? I think as a baseball player, I think baseball is an interesting sport in that it can prepare people for failure, you know, maybe a lot higher level than some other sports do. Yeah. As a, as a great hitter in baseball, you have a 300 average. And what that means means 30%. What that means is you don't do the job seven times out of 10. You only succeeded three out of 10 times. So immediately right. I think baseball players tend to be a little bit more capable of dealing with things when they don't go their way. Um, but as a baseball player, I mean, specifically, it's so hard to make it. I mean, you, you just, you, you can't really have a very good perspective on what it means to be, you know, excellent at a game like baseball. Soccer is similar, holy geez, soccer is played in every freaking country in the world. 
basketball similar, you know, hockey, I'm not going to downplay hockey and say it's only played in some places of the world because it's an arena and all that stuff that sports played all over the world too. And when you take a moment and think about any grade that you're in, I mean, we're talking about seniors in high school this year, kids that are in the class of 21 and they're thinking I'm going to score myself a scholarship. I mean, there aren't hundreds of thousands of scholarships out there. There's maybe thousands in in the U S like maybe there's some D ones that are giving out big money. Maybe there's a couple of D twos, maybe a school like you and I went to Rihanna that gives out tuition waivers. Maybe you can land one of those, but I think it's really hard for young athletes to have the right perspective on it. And I think sometimes, you know, parents and coaches and communities will kind of feed into a kid's mindset around how great they are and I think that's good because we want to instill confidence in our kids but at the same time I mean I spent my entire upbringing me and one other guy my buddy Ryan Croton who I'm sure you remember Rihanna he he actually hilariously enough I'm not sure if you heard about him lately he lives in Scottsdale Arizona now and he is the second to the top strength coordinator for the Anaheim Angels yes, in the major I follow, leagues. I yeah, follow yeah. him and I'm so proud of him. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. He he took a long path to get there and it's kind of hilarious. Growing up, he and I were neck and neck as ball players. I'm the guy that played minor league ball, but in the end, he's the guy that actually got to the big leagues. <laughs> Pretty cool because he spends a lot of time with the big league guys. He sent me a lot of clips and videos of him working with the guys and it's just incredible to see that he's made it that far. But, you know, Ryan and I, growing up in Whitby and Durham region, we just trashed everybody for a long time. And as amazing as he and I were in the Toronto area, once we were kind of, you know, once the gates were open and we were allowed to swim out there in the ocean, holy geez, there are some killers out there. So as good as good as I was and as sure as I was that I was going to make it and as much as I still kind of have in my mind that things could have went different if this or that had added up differently. Yeah. There was a lot of great ball players, and anybody yeah. that's thinking about going pro or landing that scholarship, you got to work your butt off and you just got to have blind devotion to get yourself there. But at the same time, you got to be honest with yourself and you got to be honest with what's going on out there. And you just have to have a very keen understanding of the reality. And the reality is this there's a lot of players out there. You're going to be better than a lot of them, a lot of them are going to be much better than you. But the only thing that you can really kind of determine is how hard you work and how committed you stay. So, you know, yeah. talent is a big thing. Talent's not going to take you the whole way. One yeah. out of a million times, talent will take you the whole way. But it's a combination of that skill. It's a combination of working at it. And it's a combination of kind of never taking no for an answer. If, if I had to take a no for an answer, I never would have got a scholarship. I never would have played pro ball. I had a lot of guys in high school tell me, I wasn't good enough. I can't make this team. I can't make that team. You're not going to make it. And I kind of decided, you know what? You're wrong. Good for you. I know that I know that I can do it and I know that I can work hard enough to do it and I'm going to make it happen. And I went out there and I made it happen. But the reality of it is it doesn't always shake down that way. And if you give it your all and you try to make it happen and you come up a little bit short, I think it's important to understand that you're going to live the rest of your life knowing that you put it all in. I mean, Yeah. yeah going for it and kind of going for it and kind of becoming a 25, 30 year old adult and looking back and saying, you know what? I kind of tried, maybe I could have tried more. I think that's the most important piece just to know what you want and to go all in and to bust your hump as hard as you can and try to make it happen. If it happens, it happens. And if it don't, you live the rest of your life knowing that you didn't even give it, you know, one shred less than you could have. Yeah. We're wrapping up where um, I could talk to you forever about all this kind of stuff. And I have a lot of more questions, but I would love to know um, just based on that grit that you're talking about and that perseverance, where did that come from? Did you have coaches that were instilling that into you? Was that a family thing or did you just have this burning core that needed to just show the world that you had something special? Um, I think it's, you know, my, my dad helped me with that a lot when I was young, like it was, it was a matter of, you know, you get three strikes, kiddo, you get three strikes and you might as well get in there and take your cuts. And even if it doesn't work on those first three, you're probably going to get another at bat. So get in there and take your cuts again. And even if you lose today, we're playing tomorrow. And if, even if we don't win tomorrow, it's okay. We got next year. So it was this kind of this endless idea that no matter how hard you get knocked down, you can always get back up. Okay. Um, Now, sorry, carry on. 
No, no, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to think because what I see a lot of right now, unfortunately, is that parents are crazy hard on their kids. So they're not actually showing that optimism and that positive side. They're actually breaking the kid down over and over and over again. And it makes me really sad to see that. So what would you say to parents so that they understand how you can get the most out of kids? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think it it has to do with expectation. And I don't think kids manage expectations very well because they don't have enough life experiences added up to allow them to kind of have realistic expectations. I think the expectations should come from the parents. And I think parents do a lot of disservice to their kids when they put the expectation of winning in the kid's head or the expectation of scoring goals or hitting home runs or anything like that that's not what this is about and if you're a parent and you're teaching your kid that this is what it's about you're you're doing it wrong I mean little Johnny needs to go out there and try his butt off and be a great teammate and and pay respect to the umpire and pay respect to the game and pull it all out on the line and if he comes back home at the end of the night and he was 0 for 3 but he swung as hard at every at bat. And if he dropped four fly balls, but he called mine and tried to make that catch and he did everything he could to try to win and he came up short, then he did everything he could and you should be 100% proud of him. I think it's not about the result at the end of the day, winning, losing. It's about is our kid, are our kids going out there, doing their best, having a good time, getting those good, valuable life experiences that are helping them turn into positive adults. And if they're doing everything they can, and if we're supporting them in all those efforts, then we're doing it right. But if we're putting the stress on wins and losses and stats, and where's my kid going to be next year, triple A, double A, all that kind of stuff, not important. Make sure your kids have fun. Make sure they're trying their butts off. Make sure they're in the right social environment with good coaches and a good kind of supportive foundation and then win or lose we did our job because they're having great valuable experiences that are going to contribute to a a positive and you know exciting kind of life we we don't need to focus on those negative things winning is great but it's not what it's all about yeah and I think we learn a lot from our losses so being aware of what that feels like when you lose or when things don't go your way I think that really shapes you as a person as well I agree. I agree. Absolutely. And I think, you know, any sport you play, you're never going to win all the time. I think it's hard for some kids growing up that have a, have a lot of kind of excellent things, excellent qualities about them, especially in a specific sport, they get used to winning all the time. And then all of a sudden you lose and you don't know how to deal with it. You're, you're not going to get every job, you know, you're going to find that one person really interesting and you're going to ask them out on a date and they're going to say, no, it's going (laughs) to break your heart, but it's not the end of the world. You know, maybe that wasn't the right person and maybe that wasn't the right job. And maybe this wasn't the right time. And you got to know how to get yourself back up and dust off and try it over again. And I think that's what sport can really, really teach our kids. It's all about life and it's about persevering and kind of knowing who you are and being confident and giving it your best shot. And, it's going to work out your way sometimes when it does, it's great. And when it doesn't, it's all good. Just keep working at it because this life's not going to stop throwing it at you. Just got to keep working your butt off. I think we'll end it there because I don't think we can really say anything more that needs to be said. So yeah. I, I appreciate those words and I appreciate that. Uh, hopefully there will be enough of a movement where people will start to listen to these kinds of words. And, you know, little by little, we'll create a really great environment for the young kids that are coming through sport. And I think sport is amazing. And I, that's why I'm doing this because I really think that it's such a powerful tool that can, you know, take a kid, whether or not they're going to be pros or not, I don't care about that. I care that they're good people and you sum that up really, really nicely. So thank you. No problem. No problem. And I'm happy to do it. And if you have another list of questions that you want to discuss, we can do it again sometime. All good, buddy. Okay. Awesome. So we will wrap it up here. I appreciate Ryan's time. Um, I can uh, link Ryan's uh, Instagram account to this video so people can follow along with, with what he's doing. If you don't want to miss any of these conversations, you can sign up at my website, which is riannaposkin.com. And I also share youth strength and conditioning tips through email. So you can check that out. If you are a youth coach, if you're a parent, then you can get some ideas as to how to uh, just instill some really good long-term athletic development with your kids. So uh, thanks everybody. And we'll see you in the next conversation. Bye.